Hello, Facebook, uh, YouTube, the internet in general. Uh, it's my day off. There's nobody in the apartment right now. And, well, hell, I haven't been on camera in forever, which is kind of uncomfortable. I'm really not used to it, not that I ever was. Anyway, um, I wanted to take a little bit today to talk about one of my favorite TV shows of the last decade, uh, Hannibal, which I have not been able to shut up about for the past week or so. Uh, I finally got caught up on the third season, watched the finale, fucking amazing. Um, if you're not familiar with the show, uh, basically, um, it's been something of a critical darling, but never really got the ratings it needed. It's kind of a firefly scenario in that, frankly, I think it was a bit too out there and intelligent for the audience. Uh, the only reason it survived for three seasons is because it had a lot of independent funding from a French company, the name of which I cannot remember, and even if I could, I'd probably butcher it, so I'm just not even going to try. And that's pretty much the only reason that NBC let it live for three years, albeit in an increasingly abandoned state, to the point where, from what I read, a large amount of the last ten minutes of the finale had to be cobbled together from what footage they had because they didn't have the budget to do it the way they wanted to. Nonetheless, it turned out amazing. Um, anyway, this show is, I think part of the reason it never got the ratings it probably deserved is because it's a show that really, in a lot of ways, um, pushed a lot of boundaries that you wouldn't expect network TV to push. It was supremely gory. Um, in a very artistic fashion, I always thought it was really fascinating from a visual aesthetic. Uh, and it's a, a real slow burn of a show, um, in contrast to something like another one of my favorite pieces of television from, well, kind of television, uh, from the last, you know, six months to a couple of years, uh, Daredevil on Netflix, which is a great example of a show that just hooks you and you speed through and you marathon watch that bitch in like a day. Um, as opposed to that, Hannibal is much more of a, uh, I don't know, it's, it's exhausting. It's an exhausting show, is how I would put it. Just emotionally, um, it's both stressful and very slow. There's a lot of very plotting moments to it. But uh, I'm rambling now, and I'm going to try to keep this on a relatively focused path. Um, I'm also going to try to avoid overtly spoiling um, some of the more nitty-gritty details of the show. There will be spoilers for some of the more overarching things. If you're familiar with uh, Thomas Harris's novels or the films of the Hannibal franchise, uh, Science of the Lambs, Red Dragon, or the uh, often maligned Hannibal and Hannibal Rising, you kind of have an idea of what to expect here, but the show does a lot to subvert those original storylines in ways that I actually really like. So if you've seen those and you think you know what you're getting into but you haven't seen the show yet, um, tread lightly because shit gets weird. So uh, I guess um, if I'm gonna go through what I really like about this show, I'm gonna have to do it in a somewhat organized fashion. Uh, the characters are probably Kick the chair there. Um, probably one of the places where the uh, TV show diverges the heaviest from the movies and novels in that the movies and novels, I feel, placed a large emphasis on uh, the investigator character, be it Clarice Starling or um, brain farting, even though he's the main character, Will Graham. Will Graham, uh, you know, the dude that, whose name I can't remember. Great. Uh, focuses a lot more on them and the serial killers in those stories. Uh, whereas Hannibal, I feel, is actually kind of a um, neglected character in that we get a feel for him, but we don't really get to dive into his psyche too much, which is unfortunate. The show does a brilliant job of remedying that in that um, from the word go, we're introduced to Hannibal before uh, he's captured, before he is outed as Hannibal the Cannibal um, at the very waxing moments of his friendship with Will Graham. And because of that, we get to see them um, 
grow in their extremely complicated relationship in a way that we never really got to see in the original works. We're expected to believe and accept that Hannibal and Will Graham were at some point close friends, but we never really get to see it. So to a certain extent, some of the uh, emotional connection, emotional connective tissue between those two characters isn't as impactful as it should be. The show definitely remedies that in that you could say that the whole three season run is something of a twisted, almost Shakespearean love story between those two characters. Um, sorry, I keep looking off camera. I'm using my phone and the front facing camera is right here, but it's very strange to look directly at it. So I'm kind of all over the place. Again, not super comfortable being on camera. Um, and it's not just those two characters. Uh, other characters from the original works have been given much more substantial roles or even changed altogether. Uh, you've got Morpheus himself, uh, Larry Fishburne, as um, Jack something or other. I'm really blanking on names. I think it's being on camera is making me nervous. Um, Crawford, Jack Crawford. Uh, you've got uh, Alana Bloom, who is a reworked character from the original uh, stories, who has a much more prominent and very fucked up role in the show. Um, that's kind of the thing about the characters is no one, I'm not going to say no one gets out alive. Um, a lot of people don't, but that's not entirely true. But metaphorically speaking, no one gets out alive. No one leaves the story unscathed. It's uh, very much a story of of transformation and just these supremely fucked up relationships between this cast of characters. And everyone brings a very satisfying emotional gravitas to their roles. Uh, even if they start off kind of weird, I didn't really like the Alana Bloom character for the first two seasons. Neither did my girlfriend. We were just both super pissed off at her all the time. She gets really good in season three. Um, so the characters have this complex, uh, weaved inner working relationships between them that is handled with just this fantastic sense of subtlety and nuance and subtext where every conversation that anyone has um, has at least at least double meanings if not three or four meanings for every single thing that they say to each other which can get weird um, and the show is not really set in a grounded reality. It is to a certain extent, but everything's also very um, flowing and poetic and kind of a heightened sense of reality where it's kind of like, no one really talks like this, but it's fascinating to listen to. And uh, it's, it's really interesting listening to how just every conversation builds the tension between these characters. And as the audience, it's especially fun because you know what everyone's hiding from each other, or you think you do. Um, certain things are subverted later on, and it has the appropriate holy shit factor. Um, but it's it's great watching them dance this dance around each other, and you know, is is Will actually trying to catch Hannibal, or is Hannibal manipulating him? You know, what's going on there? And it's 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 really gripping. It really grabs you. Um, so the characters are just, it's fun to watch their relationships, fun and horrifying to a certain extent, um, to watch their relationships grow and intertwine and see how uh, Hannibal, the puppet master and all of this, kind of uh, gets his fingers in there and works the marionette strings and kind of has everyone dancing for him. Um, even those who do it begrudgingly, like Larry Fish's Jack Crawford, um, who I think deserves a special amount of recognition because it's very easy to look at Laura, uh, Lawrence Fishburne and just think oh it's it's Morpheus it's fucking the cowboy from the Pee Wee Herman show or his brief stint on CSI which I think is kind of uh, dovetails into this because he's playing an FBI investigator um, but he's given some very emotional material to work with in the show there's a whole subplot in the first two seasons where uh, his wife um, played by uh, Gina Torres I believe her name is she played Zoe in Firefly um, his wife in real life has cancer in the show and is dying and does eventually die. Spoilers. Um, and when they have conversations and when they have moments together, um, yeah, it's that kind of purple worded, flowy, poetic dialogue that's um, very hyper surrealistic and not anything that anyone would really say in real life uh, without feeling extremely self-conscious and corny. 
but you can really feel the emotional connection between those two. And I, I, that's partially because obviously that's his wife in real life. So I'm sure he can draw on that. Like what would it be like if my wife really had cancer, how fucking torn up would I be? Um, but still it's, it's, he takes that material and he runs with it and he does a great job with it. Like you really care about their relationship. And when she does, uh, when his wife, uh, Bella does eventually die, it sucks. I mean, you really feel for him. Um, especially with the, you know, um, expected obligatory tiny manipulations that Hannibal throws in uh, throughout that relationship. Um, so Larry Fish as Jack Crawford does a fantastic job. Um, God, how could I go 10 minutes without mentioning the man himself, Hannibal? Uh, Mads Mikkelsen, just bravo to that guy. Um, I'm sure for a lot of you, especially if you've never seen the show, you know, Anthony Hopkins is Hannibal. There was Brian Cox in Manhunter, but no one fucking watched that, so whatever. Um, apologies to those who watched that and liked Brian Cox as Hannibal. He was fine. I'm just saying he's not really... Like, in the public image's eye, it's Anthony Hopkins. That's, that's Hannibal. That's Hannibal Lecter with his whole fucking thing. Um, and he did a great job with what he had in, you know, the uh, three Hannibal movies he was in. Um, the kid who played a young Hannibal in Hannibal Rising did all right, but that movie sucked, so you can't really blame him for that. Uh, that said, Mads Mikkelsen has just captured that character and made it his own. Um, when you go back and compare Anthony Hopkins' um, portrayal to Mad Mikkelsen's, Hopkins seems almost cartoonish. And if you think about it, he kind of has from the get-go. Um, he was always kind of a hammy character in those movies. Uh, you know, he really chewed scenery and people's faces. Um, but he was very cartoony with his delivery and his kind of, you know, head down, evil smile type of thing. That was not an evil smile. Um, and his fucking lip flapping. And I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. But he's never really scary. I mean, he's, the concept is scary. He's a fucking psychopath that eats people and he might kill you at any time. The concept is scary, but the character himself is never really scary. He's the least scary thing about those films. Um, Francis Dollarhide and James Gum, the serial killers from Silence of the Lambs and Red Dragon, not respectively, I just switched those around, much more frightening than Hannibal himself. Uh, Mads Mikkelsen is fucking terrifying as Hannibal. Like, Jesus Christ. He is, he takes the character of Hannibal and, I mean, granted, this is also partially thanks to the writing in the show, but for a monster, makes him shockingly, shockingly human and really digs into the, the psyche and the pathos of that character and what makes him tick and this God delusion he has that drives him to do what he does. Um, there's a great moment... I believe in the show, I think it was in the show, I'm hoping I'm not regurgitating something I read in like an analysis or review, I don't think I was. Um, I think there's a moment in the show, if I remember, it's either at the end of season two or the beginning of season three, where characters are talking about Hannibal's motivation, or maybe Hannibal's talking about it himself. Some of the stuff is kind of blurry. There's a lot of characters talking, stuff gets lost. Um, it's not like this is a professional review, I'm just kind of running my mouth for whoever's actually still listening at this point. And they talk about how uh, to Hannibal, what he does, you know, slaughtering and eating people isn't murder any more than killing a cow and making a hamburger is murder because he sees himself as so far above the average person that to him, um, it's not murder because they're not on the same level as him. It's like slaughtering an animal. And that's kind of his, uh, his pathology with the whole thing. Um, and there's also a, a very humorous uh, through line with his behavior where uh, he very purposefully seeks out, kills, and eats people who he perceives as rude. He has an interesting set of, um, I would almost say ethics. For a psychopath, he has a very strange set of personal ethics. He doesn't just kill people for the fuck of it willy-nilly. There's always a reason. There's always a, a design. Um, there's always some sort of um, logical through line in what he does. And the way he 
manipulates his way into characters' lives and controls them without them knowing and the just sinister shit he does. Especially the things you don't see him do at first that are eventually revealed in later flashbacks or um, just kind of gotcha moments. He's really a terrifying character. He's not someone... Well, maybe he is. That's maybe the most terrifying thing about him is he's, he's played with this magnetic charisma where he's this, this fascinating individual, this well-learned individual that you really... Um, if you were to meet him somewhere, you'd want to sit down and have a conversation with him, even though he does give you that, uh, that heebie-jeebies feeling like something's off with this guy. But he's got that glib charisma and, you know, everything that's textbook sociopath. And maybe that's the scariest thing about him is he's this horrible monster, but part of you really wants to get close to him and know more about him because he's so fascinating. Um, so fucking congratulations to the show and Mads Mikkelsen for taking Hannibal and turning him from this almost cartoony villain to this truly terrifying force of nature almost. Um, and then there's Hugh Dancy as Will Graham, which is its own beast, and he just manages to bring this uh, emotional weight to that character that you didn't see um, when Edward Norton played him, definitely. He, Edward Norton was kind of dry and angsty and just not very interesting, very, whereas Hugh Dancy plays him as this very tortured, uh, progressively throughout the series, very tortured character, and it kind of comes to its its peak in season two where, um, spoilers, Hannibal has more or less won and framed Will Graham for his crimes, and Will Graham is, is locked up, and everyone believes he's crazy, and he's the cannibal, and... Uh, he eventually gets out and forms this uh, relationship with Hannibal that he's supposed to be using to try to catch him, but then you begin to wonder if uh, he really is um, falling under Hannibal's spell and will join him. And even though you know in the books and in the movie um, that he doesn't, that he eventually catches Hannibal, they change so much in the show that you, you really wonder if, if that's where they're going to go, if they're going to take it there. And they almost do. Um, to a certain extent, they get very close to taking Will Graham all the way over to the other side. And it's um, spectacularly su suspenseful. Um, I mean, I could, I could go on for probably another 17 minutes about just the characters of the show and, and how they interplay and why they're fascinating, why they make it a worthy watch. But uh, frankly, I, I don't want to subject you to more of my face for longer than like a half hour tops. Uh, which kudos if you watch um, this whole fucking ramble fest. I should probably edit it down, but I just don't care. Um, so past the characters, I mean, you, the show has a fantastic sense of style. Um, Brian Fuller, who's the showrunner, uh, very openly says it's a pretensy artsy show, and it kind of is to a certain extent. Um, again, it's a slow burn, lots of poetic dialogue. The visuals are one of the most interesting things about the whole show. They manage to take these grisly, horrific uh, tableaus and dead bodies and turn them into this, these fascinating pieces of art, which are partially, um, you know, a lot of them are Hannibal's victims. So uh, it kind of plays into his character and how he's extremely sophisticated and, and artsy and very into metaphors and the metaphysical. Um, so with a lot of his tableaus, you get uh, these supremely artistic shots of like a totem pole made of uh, dismembered pieces of a body or uh, someone tied up to a tree with all their organs removed from their body cavity and replaced with bouquets of flowers in the shapes of those organs. And it's very striking and it's, it's you want to look away, but you can't. And that's... Uh, it's fascinating, and I know I've used that word a lot, fascinating, but it's, it's fantastic. Um, if you've never watched the show, my suggestion, don't make this a dinner show. Don't eat while you watch it, especially the first two seasons. The third one's less bad, but um, the first season especially, don't watch while you eat it. it. Unless you're a horrible, weird person, it will take away your appetite. Um, which is kind of weird because all the food that Hannibal makes, which is a prominent thing throughout the show, he's always cooking, obviously. Um, always having someone for dinner and over for dinner to have someone for dinner. Um, that'll make you hungry, but then you see, you know, the aftermath and what he left behind or what the serial killer of the week, because the first season of the show is very much a procedural, like, uh, killer of the week type of thing. They get away from that eventually, but it's that for a while. Um, it will take your appetite right away. You just, you won't want to eat anything. 
Uh, so they do that. They do a lot of um, very trippy, almost dream sequences, a lot of metaphorical stuff. There's uh, an interesting... Um, there's an interesting scene in season two, uh, going back to the Alana Bloom character, who is, uh, for a minute there, is a love interest for Will, and then also kind of falls under Hannibal's spell and his charisma and uh, becomes a... Um, they're not really a romantic relationship, but I call them lovers, I guess. I hate that word, but it is what it is. Uh, and there's this trippy dream sex scene in this, the second season where... You know, she's in bed with Hannibal, and, you know, there's him over here, and there's her here, and then she turns around, and there's Will in bed with her, and um, obviously the three of them are not physically in the same bed together. That would be awkward, and someone would probably get stabbed and likely eaten, um, but it's just a real weird way of, of expressing that dynamic and kind of doing a sex scene on television without being too explicit, um, though they do... God, they get all the way with a lot for a television show, like a lot. Um, it's stunning how much they manage to get away with. And if you read any review or analysis of the show, you'll find the same thing. It's, it's a lot of like, really? They can do that on NBC, really? So uh, that's interesting. But yeah, they, they do a lot of um, physical metaphors between character relationships. A lot of season three... Um, the second half of season three covers the Red Dragon storyline. So obviously Hannibal is locked up. They do eventually get him, though the way they get him is interesting and very different from the original story. Um, but anyway, he's, he's locked up in prison. And so a lot of the character interactions take place um, in what they call his mind palace, which if you've ever watched Sherlock is a, or if you've ever read, uh, any one of a number of books written by people who have fantastic memories, uh, Moonwalking with Einstein, The Art of Learning, that sort of thing. Um, you'll be familiar with the concept of a mind palace. Anyway, basically, uh, when Hannibal is interacting with various people, he, what he really is is he's standing in his you know, creepy room with his creepy suit, uh, kind of like you see Anthony Hawkins in Red Dragon, but much fancier. His, his, uh, his prison cell is almost like this white-walled room of a mansion. Um, like paneled walls and bookcases and it's interesting because it's a two-tone effect where the inside of the cell is all white and then you move to the outside of the cell past the glass and it's the same kind of walls and everything but it's all much darker um, but when he's interacting with the characters you see it in his mind where they're sitting across from each other in his therapist office because he's a, a psychologist um, and having their interactions that way harkening back to a lot of scenes in the first two seasons so it's very cool the way they do that um, God, I really am rambling here. I'm at like 22 minutes. I doubt anyone is still watching this. So yeah, visuals, interesting, very interesting. Um, and I, I have, I mean, I loathe to describe myself as an artist because it feels very pre uh, pretentious. I'm not professionally an artist. I don't make money off of any sort of art, but I do enjoy the visual aesthetic and occasionally I'll put a pencil on paper. So uh, I guess I have to call myself that. Um, so as an artist, I the visual aesthetic of the show is something that even when it got a little slow and a little grindy and just a little too much pretentious character interaction, that's something that um, really kept me coming back for more, even was just seeing, oh, what, what fucked up dead body are they going to show this week in a way that makes me want to draw it? Um, so that's a, a huge part of the show. The story, the biggest... Hmm, no, I wouldn't say biggest. I, I can't. I can't rank what elements of their show are most important. They all work together magnificently to create a fantastic product. Um, but the story is interesting because, again, as I said from the get-go, if you're familiar with uh, Thomas Harris's characters and stories, you're going to go into this thinking you know what's going to happen. and you, It keeps to enough of that where when certain things happen, you get kind of that... Um, Kind of that fanboyish feeling. Uh, if you're a comic book fan and you've watched anything from like Chris Nolan's Batman movies to the Avengers, you know it's that feeling you get when something happens in the movie and you know it's alluding to this moment in the comic book, and you're just kind of like, "Oh, they're doing that! They're doing that!" It's a lot like that. Um, but then they put a twist on it. Almost always, they put some sort of spin on it or some character who wasn't involved before, and just take it completely where you didn't expect it to go. So whether or not you're familiar with those stories or not, um, the show is going to have um, surprises for you in droves. 
Um, the way they handle the Red Dragon storyline is especially interesting uh, because you think they're wrapping it up a couple of episodes before this uh, season, and unfortunately the series uh, finale, and then they don't. And from that point on, the last two episodes are very much an anything goes affair because where you thought that story ended has already happened. And so you're stuck there for another 80 minutes between those two episodes going, fucking what are they going to do? Like, how will they end this? And it is satisfying to say the least. Um, I'm super bummed the show's not being renewed for a fourth season, but if this is how they have to go out, I'm okay with it. I'll cover that at the very end uh, so that if you haven't seen the show or if for some reason you're still watching this and you do want to watch the show at some point, you don't have the whole ending totally spoiled for you. Um, but the story is, uh, its like I said, it's a slow burn. You're not going to binge watch this. At least I don't recommend it. Um, first of all, because its it can get very grisly and it's a little hard to take in large doses. The character interaction is, uh, it can get grating if you watch it for like two and a half hours. You know, you kind of get tired of everyone throwing this super metaphorical flowy dialogue at each other. Um, and it's just such a stressful, suspenseful show, especially at, you know, the climaxes of each of the seasons where shit's really going down. Um, it's, it's very hard to watch. Uh, in a long form. I actually semi-binge watched the last season. I watched it about three or four episodes at a time, and that was only because I was really excited to get to the end. Um, and even that was kind of tough to do. The third season's easier to binge watch because there's really not as much of the gore and the uh, emotional suspense. But it's, it's still not something you're going to sit down and watch for six hours. Um, but yeah, the story is... Uh, like I said, really just kind of a Shakespearean fucked up love story between Hannibal and Will Graham and kind of how they evolve and what the nature of their relationship is. And that's something I have to really applaud the show for is it would have been easy for them to take a very heavy handed, blunt approach to their relationship. Um, it's, <clears throat> I don't know how to put this to where it won't sound somewhat offensive. Um, I have no problem with it, but there's, you know, there's a trend lately, I feel, in pop culture of taking established uh, characters and mythos and diversifying it up a bit by making characters who weren't previously gay, gay, or making them women or a different race. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's led to some really interesting stuff. Uh, there's a female Thor in Marvel that has been a great run. Um, there's, you know, Miles Morales as Spider-Man in the Marvel continuity. Um, I obviously read a lot of comic books. And even in Hannibal itself, there are, you know, Jack Crawford's a black guy, Alan Bloom becomes Alana Bloom, uh, Frederick Lowndes becomes Freddie Lowndes, a red-haired psycho bitch. Uh, so they do a lot of that in the show itself, but it would have been very easy for them to be very heavy-handed and, like, turn Will and Hannibal kind of gay and just make that a very um, overt thing. And, I mean, if they'd done that, it still would be an interesting show. But the nuance and subtlety of their relationship is um, masterfully crafted. And uh, I think part of that is owed to the fact that Brian Fuller, the uh, showrunner and, and the guy who conceptualized all of this, is in fact gay himself. So I think uh, he's especially equipped to look at uh, maybe a, non you know, a very non-conventional, unconventional um, form of male relationship and kind of hash that out on the screen. And I think he does a great job of it. Um, because admittedly, um, not to get too heavy, but dude relationships are, are hard to navigate because there's a constant stigma of like, I feel like women in friendships can be kind of on that line and it's okay and no one really cares, like calling each other girlfriend and shit. It's different with dudes. It's different with guys You can't really do that. I mean. In the privacy of the guy relationship, shit can get kind of gay. I don't even mean in a sexual way. I just I, it, see that's what I mean. It's really hard to discuss, especially as a straight guy. Um, but in Hannibal, they do a great job of of exploring the idea of love between two men, but not having it necessarily be a sexual love. And it's something that um, ah hell, I'm just gonna go into like really heavy spoilers for the last half of the last season. Uh, there's a moment in the last two episodes of uh, Hannibal where Will Graham overtly asks another character, is Hannibal in love with me? 
And um, the answer is pretty much yes. And then she asks him, you know, do you ache for him? And that's a dynamic they explore throughout the show where uh, Han- like Will clearly has this um, magnetic attraction to Hannibal. Not necessarily a sexual one, but this twisted sort of love for him in a sense where Hannibal really has helped Will explore his inner psyche and his inner pathos and, and this fucked up part of him because Will Graham's whole conceit is uh, he can empathize with killers and that's what helps him catch them is he can kind of put himself in their shoes and reconstruct crime scenes. That's a whole other part of the show I didn't really cover because um, that's another v- like really visually striking part of it is him kind of closing his eyes and there's this uh, like wiping effect and this vroom noise and then he kind of puts himself in that crime scene and walks through how he did it and always ends with this catchphrase of, this is my design. Um, but anyway, Hannibal really uh, helps Will explore that and kind of explore who he is. And uh, and so it's this, it's this constant back and forth. It's this almost this will they, won't they type thing, but in the most messed up way possible. Um, and you're kind of constantly guessing throughout the show, like, does Will really want to catch Hannibal or... Is he going to let him go? Just all the way to the end. And the last 10 minutes of the show is this, um, well, the last episode, but the last 10 minutes especially, the last episode is this idea where, you know, the Red Dragon killer is still out there. This is where, okay, we're getting into pretty heavy spoilers. So if you haven't seen any of the show, just probably you can stop watching now because I, I've, I've said a lot of what I want to say about the show and why it's so good and just trying to get that out there and this is almost more for my benefit as much as anyone else's just because I really want to talk about it. And my girlfriend hasn't watched the third season yet. We're planning to do that pretty soon. Um, it's just hard to find time. Work is crazy. Uh, so I really want to talk to her really explicitly about it, but I, I don't want to spoil the ending. I already spoiled a couple things for her. Um, we watched the first two seasons together, so I'm kind of waiting for that. So right now I just kind of need to blab to whoever's listening. Um, sorry. Your mouth gets really dry when you talk for a half hour straight. Anyway, so the last episode, uh, Francis Dollarhide, the Red Dragon Killer, uh, is still out there uh, after faking his own death. And Will sets up this ruse with him where he convinces him that Hannibal's betrayed them both. And so they should, uh, he should change Hannibal uh, because basically the Red... Ooh, it's raining real hard outside. Uh, Washington. The Red Dragon Killer's thing is like he doesn't see himself as murdering people. He sees himself as changing them. He has this whole theme of metamorphosis that he's going through. It's, it's, it's super interesting. Um, despite only devoting half a season to Red Dragon, they cover it much more thoroughly than the movie does because even half a season, uh, they still have you know, six 45-minute episodes, which is much longer than the Red Dragon movie. Um, they pull it off really well. Anyway, so uh, Will convinces uh, Francis Dollarhide that he needs to kill Hannibal. And uh, so... Will goes back to Jack Crawford and the FBI and sets up this whole plan without telling Jack Crawford that he's already talked to Francis Dollarhide. This is where you start to really question what Will is doing and, and what his plans are here. Um, there's this very dark tone to it, this knowing tone. Anyway, he suggests this plan where uh, they fake um, a prison escape by Hannibal and draw Francis Dollarhide, the Red Dragon, out that way. Uh, what they don't expect is as they are transporting Hannibal to this fake escape, uh, Francis Dollarhide comes up. I'm just going to start calling him the dragon. Francis Dollarhide is a ridiculous name. It's no wonder Sorry he became a serial Apparently killer. Apparently I reached the maximum recording limit on a, a phone video. Never done that before. Anyway, uh, Francis Dollarhide, ridiculous name. Um, so anywho, uh, fuck, that interrupted my whole train of thought. Oh yeah, so he rolls up in the cop car and kills the entire FBI guard, which um, I feel like that, that's a little unrealistic. I don't think one guy could take out an entire FBI guard, but whatever. Uh, but he leaves Hannibal and Will alive, and Hannibal and Will kind of, uh, Hannibal very matter-of-factly takes his whole face mask off. Um, they do the, the face mask in the show, and it's, it's really satisfying when you see it. It's kind of like, yes, there it is. Again, it's one of those fanboy moments. Um, and they get in the cop car and they drive to Hannibal's old uh, kind of cliffside getaway. Um, they have some interesting uh, retrospective conversation with uh, all the subtext you'd expect from the show with Hannibal talking about uh, cliffside eroding and how they'll all be in the water soon and how there was more land when he was there with this person and more even when he was there with this other person and, and now he's here with Will and there's... Anyway, so they sit there and they have their conversation and they wait for... Uh, for the red dragon to, to get to them and he does and he, he shoots a bullet through uh, 
through the window of this house and, and shoots Hannibal through his torso. And it's, it's a very visually striking shot as you'd expect. Um, and he starts to, he sets up a camera and starts to film. He plans to film Hannibal's death. Um, and then he surprise, uh, stabs Will in the face. Um, which if you've read Red Dragon, you're familiar with the fact that Will Graham is disfigured by, uh, Dollar Hyde. Um, stabs him right through the cheek, very fight club. And, uh, it's a lot of blood, it's a very bloody scene, and they kind of go back and forth stabbing each other. Will takes a knife out of him and stabs Dollar Hyde. Dollar Hyde takes a knife out of him and stabs Will. Uh, Hannibal at some point gets himself off the ground and tackles Dollar Hyde, and they spill out to this uh, veranda area of the house. Um, it's getting darker, my face looks bluer on the recording. Weird train of thought. Anyway, um, and just the last five minutes is this. this visually fantastic, amazing scene of, of Hannibal and Will teaming up to take this guy down. And they take him down with an axe and a pocket knife and Hannibal kind of jumps on his back, you know, uh, if you've ever seen MMA, you know, he kind of takes his back or if you need a, a less fighting based example, kind of like a monkey on his back, you know, had legs wrapped around him, hands around him, like a piggyback ride. And uh, kind of goes and, and uh, takes a chunk out of his throat as Will stabs him in the heart. And there's this whole great visual scene of Dollar Hyde dying with these dragon wings formed in blood splaying out around him um, on the, the, the ground. And Will and Hannibal finally share this embrace uh, where Hannibal tells Will, this is all I've ever wanted for you, you know, for us. And, and Will says it's beautiful. And, and there's this, this moment where you realize, oh, you know, uh, it's happened. These two are uh, not sexually necessarily, but in a certain way, they're together now. And like that romance has finally blossomed and Will's finally giving in. And uh, this great song that they had Susie Sue uh, of Susie and the Banshees write just for the show kicks in. And it's just this great culmination of everything in the series and everything coming full circle. And then Will fucking takes Hannibal off a cliff with him, and they both tumble into the ocean below, and you have no idea what happens, and that's the end. And uh, it's the idea of, I, I guess it's, you know, Will's final heroic act, because he realizes that he can't resist this, that he's going to give in to Hannibal, and the only way he can save himself uh, is to take them both out, is to take Hannibal out and take, you know, go with him, or to take himself out and take Hannibal with him. And it's it's this bleak but really satisfying conclusion to this twisted just constant guessing game of a relationship between those two characters throughout the series and like I said um, I wish there was a fourth season but if this is how it has to go out I, bravo I mean that's that's a great ending I sat there for like 10 minutes afterwards um, just kind of going holy shit um, and I keep I keep telling my girlfriend like holy shit that ending holy shit that ending but I can't say anything because she hasn't seen it yet uh, but it's it's just fantastic um i don't i i could go on for like a couple more hours about the show but I, no one's gonna watch that and i don't really want to i just i really needed to um just kind of wax you know uh, wax affectionate about this show because it's, it's in my opinion, a television masterpiece. Um, I think it will definitely go on to be a, a cult classic and uh, I hope it eventually gets the recognition it deserves because Jesus Christ, this is, it's television unlike anything I've ever seen before. It's television on a, a cinematic scale um, that you just don't see in most things and uh, I really look forward to what Brian Fuller does next. Um, the next thing he's doing is actually a TV adaption of Neil Gaiman's American Gods for stars, which I'm really looking forward to because I fucking love that book. Um, I love anything Neil Gaiman writes. He's dude is one of my heroes. Um, so I'm after seeing Hannibal and how he did that, I am so looking forward to how he's going to handle American Gods because that book is full of so much potential uh, trippy visuals you could do and just weird character stuff. Um, and he's left the door open, you know, he's, he said that, you know, if, uh, if everything lines up, they might eventually go back and do a, a, a feature film instead of a fourth season for Hannibal. And I would definitely be down to watch that. They could go even, even darker than they do in the show in a, a film. It would for sure be rated R. Um, 
but I'd love to see that. I would love if they could get picked up by something like Amazon or Netflix, even though both of them have already declined, but you never know in the future. You know, Netflix brought Arrested Development back how many years after it ended? Um, so you never know, you know, if they do a fourth season, they've definitely left the doors open to where they could get real interesting. There is a, um, a post credit sting um, that uh, definitely leaves the door open for some interesting shit to happen involving a character that I didn't even really cover in this whole video, uh, who's played by, um, blanking on it, actress who played Scully in the X-Files. You know who I'm talking about. Anyway, she plays a character who has another just deeply fucked up, flawed relationship with Hannibal. And I, I, could, I could go forever talking about the whole thing. The point is, Hannibal's an amazing show, and it's... It's the kind of television that doesn't come on, you know, come along every day. Like, this is, it's, it's something special. And if you enjoy horror, if you enjoy trippy visuals, uh, if you enjoy a good story, just good characters, and, and really being kept on your toes and, and not necessarily being able to predict where everything goes, um, this is definitely a show you want to check out. Um, seems a bit weird to say that now that I've already detailed the ending of the show. That's good on me. Great job. But uh, yeah, uh, it's probably some of my favorite television in the last decade. I'm definitely gonna go through and watch all three seasons again. Um, just I haven't watched the first two since they aired. Uh, I, I kind of meant to before season three, but then I was just too excited about it and I didn't want to sit through two 13 episode seasons. Um, definitely gonna watch season three again because I have to watch it with my girlfriend again. Um, she's super stoked about it. So, uh, I, I don't really know how to close a video. Um, it's not like this is going to be a professionally edited thing or anything. Uh, if, you, if you've stuck it out for the 40 minutes I've been talking, uh, congratulations. And maybe you want to punch me in the face, but hopefully not. Um, I don't know. I guess that's all I really have to say about it. It's a fantastic show. It's one of my favorite things of the past decade. I wish there was more of it. Um, I'm really excited to see what Brian Fuller does next. I'm really excited to see what Mads Mikkelsen does next because that dude's a tremendous actor. I'm excited to see what Hugh Dancy does next because he's also a tremendous actor. Um, and if they ever bring it back, I will definitely be there, you know, whether it's a film or um, a season on, you know, Amazon or Netflix or Hulu or wherever. Uh, for sure, I will be first in line to see it. So, um, yeah, Hannibal. It's, it's amazing and it's a shame it got caught off, you know, um, kind of halfway uh, through its its run because Brian Fuller is planning a full like six season arc, um, but they for what they did they went out on a really good note. So uh, I, I'm saying uh more and more at this point. So I, I guess that's probably a sign that I should stop recording and go do something else productive with my day instead of sitting in front of a camera and indulging myself and staring at my face for a half hour, which is really weird. It's not comfortable. Um, I'm just picking at my various physical flaws in my mind. It's, it's horrible. If you were in here right now, you would just, it's internal screaming just the whole time. <laughs> so, uh, I, I guess I'm done. Um, maybe I'll do this again at some point for something else I like. It's rare I like things this much. Um, if I watched it recently, I would definitely do it for Daredevil. That show is amazing. Um, maybe the next movie I watch, I'm planning to watch Straight Outta Compton pretty soon. Because I, I, I like myself some Dr. Dre. Um, possibly the physically whitest person you've ever seen in your entire life. But yeah, uh, I enjoy that. So maybe I'll do one of these for those or uh, some other TV show or a video game or something. I'll try to keep it brief next time. I need to like write down bullet points instead of just rambling for 40 minutes. Um, but uh, it's, it's been fun. And um, I don't think I informed anyone about anything. So this has been awesome. <laughs>